Gargantua, at the age of 400, fourscore and 44 years, begat his son Pantagruel upon his wife Badibek, daughter of the king of the Amuro in Utopia, who died in childbirth. For he was so amazingly large and so heavy that he could not come into the world without suffocating his mother. No one could have been more astonished and perplexed than his father, Gargantua. For seeing on the one side his wife, Bardebeck, newly dead, and on the other his son, Pantagruel, newly born, and so big and handsome, he did not know what to do or say. His mind was troubled with doubt whether he ought to weep in mourning for his wife or laugh out of delight at his son. On either side he found sophistical arguments which took his breath away. For he framed them very well in modo et figura, but he could not resolve them. And consequently he remained trapped, like a mouse caught in pitch or a kite taken in a noose. Shall I weep, he said. Yes. Why then? Because my wife, who was so good, is dead. She was the most this and the most that that ever was in the world. I shall never see her again, and I shall never find one like her. This is at last beyond all calculation. Oh, my God, what have I done to thee that thou shouldst punish me so? Why didst thou not send death to me before sending it to her? For to live without her is no more than a lingering death. Ah, Badebeck, my sweet, my darling, my little coney, hers was a good three acres and two roods in size for all that, my tenderling, my codpiece, my shoe, my slipper, never shall I see you again. Oh, poor Pantagruel, you have lost your good mother, your sweet nurse, your beloved lady. Ah, false death. How unkind you are to me. How cruel you are to me. To wrench from me her whose rightful due was immortality. And as he spoke, he bellowed like a cow. But when Pantagruel came into his mind, he suddenly began laughing like a calf. Oh, my little son, he cried, my bollocklet, my footkin, how pretty you are. How grateful I am to God for having given me such a fine son, such a jolly little fellow, so smiling and gay. Ho, 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 ho! How glad I am. Let's drink, ho, oh, and banish all melancholy. Bring some of the best. Rinse the glasses, lay the cloth, drive out those dogs, blow up that fire, light that candle, shut that door, cut up this toast for soup, send these poor people away and give them that they want. Take my gown and let me strip to my doublet, the better to entertain my company. As he said this, he heard the litanies and dirges of the priests who were carrying his wife to the grave. So he broke off his talk and was suddenly carried off in another direction, saying, Lord God, must I turn sad again? It grieves me. I'm no longer young. I'm growing old. The weather is dangerous. I might catch some fever. And then... I should be done for. By my faith as a nobleman, it's better to weep less and drink more. My wife is dead. Well, in God's name, dodge your auntie. I shan't bring her back to life by my tears. She is well off. She's in paradise at least, if in no better place. She's praying to God for us. She's very happy. She's not worrying any more about our miseries and calamities. The same fate hangs over our heads. God care for those who remain alive. I must think of finding another. But this is what you must do, said he to the midwives, the wise women. But where are they? <laughs> Good creatures, I cannot see you anywhere. Go to her burial, and in the meantime, I'll rock my son here. For I feel very unwell and might be in danger of falling sick. But drink a good draught beforehand. You'll find yourselves the better for it. Believe me, on my honor. In obedience to his orders, they went to the funeral service and burial, and poor Gargantua remained at home, during which time he composed an epitaph to be engraved as follows. Dead is the noble Badebeck, who had a face like a Rebeck, a Spanish body and a belly like a Swiss frau. She died, I tell ye, in childbed. Pray to God that her he pardon wherein she did err. 
Here lies her body, which did live uh, free from all vice, as I believe, and did decease poor simple bride the year and day on which she died. I find from the old historiographers and poets that many were born into this world in very strange manners, which would take too long to recount. Read the seventh book of Pliny, if you have the leisure. Yet never did you hear of so marvelous a birth as Pantagruel's, for it was almost beyond belief how he grew in body and strength in so short a time. What Hercules did was as nothing, when in his cradle he killed two serpents, for those serpents were only small and weak. But Pantagruel, while still in the cradle, did quite astounding things. I will omit to relate here how, at each of his meals, he swigged off the milk of our thousand six hundred cows, and how all the saucepan makers of Saumur in Anjou, of Villedieu in Normandy, and of Bramont in Lorraine, were employed in making him a saucepan to boil his soup in, and how they gave him this soup in a great drinking trough, which is to this day at Bourges, near the palace. But his teeth were already so well grown and strong that he broke a great piece out of this trough, as can well be seen. So Pantagruel grew from day to day and visibly progressed, which rejoiced his father's natural affections. While he was quite small, Gargantua had a crossbow made for him to shoot at little birds, and this is now known as the Great Bow of Chantel. Then he sent him to school to learn and to make profitable use of his youth. So he went to Poitiers to study and did well there. Then he came to Bourges, where he studied for a considerable time and did very well in the faculty of law. Sometimes he said that the law book seemed to him like a fine cloth of gold robe, marvelously grand and costly, but trimmed with dun. For he said, there are no books in the world so fine, so ornate, and so elegant as the texts of the Pandects, but the trimming of them. That is to say, Accursius's gloss is so foul, stinking, and infamous that it is no better than filth and villainy. When he left Bourges, he came to Orléans, and uh, there found a lot of made him a great welcome on his arrival. And in a short time, he learned to play tennis with them so well that he became a champion. For the students at that place are great practitioners of the game, and sometimes they took him to the islands also to amuse himself at nine pins. But as for breaking his head with overmuch study, he would not do that at all, for fear of spoiling his sight, especially as one of the professors often said in his lectures that there is nothing so bad for the sight as disease of the eyes. And one day, when a scholar of his acquaintance, who had hardly more knowledge than the rest of the brood, but on the other hand was very good at dancing and tennis, took his licentiate in law, Pantagruel composed this blazon and device for the licentiates of that university. A tennis ball in the card placket, in the hand a tennis racket, skill at the slow dance to trip it, and there's the licentiate hooded. As you may well suppose, Pantagruel studied very hard, for he had a double-sized intelligence and a memory equal in capacity to the measure of twelve skins and twelve casks of oil. But while he was staying in Paris, he one day received a letter from his father which read as follows. There you will find many praiseworthy examples to follow. You have Epistemon for your tutor, and he can give you living instruction by word of mouth. It was my earnest wish that you shall become a perfect master of languages, first of Greek, as Quintilian advises, secondly of Latin, and then of Hebrew, on account of the Holy Scriptures, also of Chaldean and Arabic, for the same reason, and I would have you model your Greek style on Plato's and your Latin on that of Cicero. Keep your memory well stocked with every tale from history, and here you will find help in the cosmographs of the historians. Of the liberal arts, geometry, arithmetic, and music, I gave you some smattering when you were still small at the age of five or six. Go on and learn the rest, also the rules of astronomy. But leave divinatory astrology and Lily's art alone, I beg of you, for they are frauds and vanities. Of civil law, I would have you learn the best texts by heart and relate them to the art of philosophy. And as for the knowledge of nature's works, I should like you to give careful attention to that too. 
so that there may be no sea, river, or spring of which you do not know the fish. All the birds of the air, all the trees, shrubs, and bushes of the forest, all the herbs of the field, all the metals deep in the bowels of the earth, the precious stones of the whole east and the south, let none of them be unknown to you. Then scrupulously peruse the books of the Greek, Arabian, and Latin doctors once more, not omitting the Talmudists and the Kabbalists, and by frequent dissections gain a perfect knowledge of that other world which is man. At some hours of the day also begin to examine the Holy Scriptures, first the New Testament and the epistles of the apostles in Greek, and then the Old Testament in Hebrew. In short, let me find you a veritable abyss of knowledge. For later, when you have grown into a man, you will have to leave this quiet and repose of study to learn chivalry and warfare, to defend my house, and to help our friends in every emergency against the attacks of evildoers. Furthermore, I wish you shortly to show how much you have profited by your studies, which you cannot do better than by publicly defending a thesis in every art against all persons whatsoever, and by keeping the company of learned men who are as common in Paris as elsewhere. But because, according to the wise Solomon, wisdom enters not the malicious heart, and knowledge without conscience is but the ruin of the soul, it befits you to serve, love, and fear God, to put all your thoughts and hopes in Him, and by faith grounded in charity to be so conjoined with Him that you may never be severed from Him by sin. Be suspicious of the world's deceits, and set not your heart on vanity, for this life is transitory, but the word of God remains eternal. Be helpful to all your neighbors, and love them as yourself. Respect your tutors. Avoid the company of those whom you would not care to resemble, and do not omit to make use of those graces which God has bestowed on you. Then, when you see that you have acquired all the knowledge to be gained in those parts, return to me so that I may see you and give you my blessing before I die. My son, the peace and grace of our Lord be with you. Amen. From Utopia, the 17th day of the month of March, your father, Gargantua. After receiving and reading this letter, Pantagruel took fresh courage and was inspired to make greater advances than ever. Indeed, if you had seen him studying and measured the progress he made, you would have said that his spirit among the books was like fire among the heather, so indefatigable and ardent was it. With his father's letter and admonitions well in mind, Pantagruel decided one day to test his learning. Accordingly, at all the crossways of the city, he put up propositions to the number of 9,764 on all subjects, touching in them on the most debated point in every science. And first of all, in the Rue du Feur, he contended against all the professors, students in arts and orators, and turned them all upside down. Then in the Sorbonne, he argued with the theologians for the space of six weeks, from four in the morning till six at night except for a two-hour interval to take his refreshment and repast. And here were present the majority of the lords of the court and the masters of requests, presidents, councillors, treasury men, secretaries, advocates, and others, together with the sheriffs of that city, the physicians, and the canon lawyers. I note that the greater part of these took the bit between their teeth. But notwithstanding their ergos and sophistry, he made fools of them all and conclusively proved to them that they were just calves in petticoats. At this, all the world began to be loud with talk of his amazing knowledge, even to the old women, laundresses, go-betweens, roast meat sellers, penknife merchants, and others, who called out, That's he! as he passed through the streets. At this, he was as delighted as was Demosthenes, the prince of Greek orators, when a bent old woman pointed her finger at him and said, That is the man! Now, at this very time, there was a suit pending in the court between two great lords, Lord Kismayas, the plaintiff, on the one hand, and Lord Suckfizzle, the defendant, on the other. 
And that difference was on such rare and difficult points of law that the Court of Parliament understood it no better than double Dutch. So, by the King's command, there were assembled four of the most learned and fattest from all the Parliament of France, including the Great Council and all the principal professors of the universities, not only of France, but also of England and Italy, men such as Jason, Philippus Decius, Petrus of Petronibus, and a rabble of other old rabbinists. But after remaining in session for the space of 46 weeks, they had been unable to get their teeth into it or to gain a clear enough understanding of the case to settle any aspect of it whatsoever, which so upset them that they most villainously beshat themselves for shame. But one of them, named Dudouet, the most learned, the most expert, and the shrewdest of them all, said to them one day when they were philogrobalized in the brain, Gentlemen, we have been here for a long time now without doing anything but waste time, and we can find neither shore nor bottom to this abysmal matter. The more we study it, the less we understand it, which is a great shame and a burden on our consciences, and it is my opinion that we shall emerge from all this in disgrace, for in our discussions we are doing nothing but wander. But here is an idea that occurs to me. You must have heard of that great personage, Master Pantagruel by name, who has proved himself learned above the capacities of the present age in the public disputes which he has maintained against all comers. It is my opinion that we ought to call him in and confer with him on this matter, for no one will ever get to the bottom of this if he does not. All the councillors and doctors readily agreed to this. So they sent for Pantagruel immediately and begged him kindly to investigate the case, to sift it thoroughly and to draw them up a report on it in due legal form and at his own discretion. And they delivered over to him the brief sacks, deeds and documents, which were nearly enough to load four great jackasses. But Pantagruel said to them, Gentlemen, are the two lords who are fighting this suit still alive? To which came the answer, yes. Then what the devil's the use of all this accumulation of papers and transcripts you're giving me? Isn't it better to hear their dispute from their own lips than to read all this monkey business here? It will be nothing but trickery and devilish dodges out of Sepolo's book and twistings and perversions of the law. I'm sure that you and all those through whose hands the suit has passed I've worked in all you could pro et contra by now, and that even if their dispute was clear and easy to decide at first, you have obscured it with stupid and illogical arguments and inept opinions from Accursius, Baldus, Bartolus, De Castro, De Imolo, Hippolytus, Panomitanus, Bertuschin, Alexander, Curtius, and all those other old masters. They never understood the simplest law in the Pandects, they were just so many blockheads who did not even know the first thing you need for a legal understanding. They had no knowledge of Latin or Greek, you can be certain of that, but only the Gothic and barbarian tongues. Yet, in the first place, law derives from the Greeks, a fact for which you have the testimony of Alpion in the final book of his Origin of the Law, and all the laws are full of Greek words and sentences. Also, secondly, a digest has been made of them in Latin, the most elegant and ornate writing in all the Latin tongue, and I not willingly make an exception of Sallust or Varro or Cicero or Seneca or Titus Livius or Quintilian. How then could those old dodderers have understood the text of the laws, since they had never seen a good book in the Latin tongue, as is manifestly clear from their style, which is the style of a chimney sweep or a cook or a scullion, but not that of a jury's consult? What is more, the laws are based on essential philosophy, both moral and natural. How can these fools understand them, then, when they have studied less philosophy by God than my mule? As for humane learning and knowledge of antiquities and histories, they know about as much of that as a toad has feathers. But the laws are full of it, and they cannot be understood without it, as one day I shall demonstrate at greater length and in writing. Therefore, if you wish me to take cognizance of this suit, first do me the favor of having all these papers burnt, and secondly, let the two gentlemen come before me in person. 
Then, when I have heard them, I will give you my opinion of the case without any sort of disguise or dissimulation. Some of the lawyers made objections, since, as you know, there are more fools than wise men in all societies, and the larger party always gains the upper hand, as Titus Livius said when speaking of the Carthaginians. But the aforementioned Dewey manfully opposed them, contending that Pantagruel was right, and that these records, questionnaires, replies, discrediting of witnesses, rehabilitation of witnesses, and other such hellish practices, were nothing but perversions of the law and means of prolonging the suit. They would all go to the devil, he said, if they did not change their course and proceed according to evangelical and philosophical equity. In short, all the papers were burnt, and the two gentlemen were summoned in person. Upon which Pantagruel inquired, Are you the two who have this great difference between you? Yes, my lord, they answered. Which of you is the plaintiff? I am, said Lord Kismayas. Now, my friend, tell me your whole complaint, point by point, and stick to the truth. For so help me, if you tell so much as one word of a lie, I'll strike your head off your shoulders, just to show you that when it is a question of justice and judgments, nothing must be said that is not the absolute truth. So take good care not to add or subtract a jot or a tittle in telling me your case. Proceed. Then Kiss My Ass pleaded his case. Then Pantagruel said, My friend, do you wish to say anything more? No, my lord, replied Kiss My Ass, for I've said the whole lesson from beginning to end, and I haven't varied from it in any way upon my honor. You then, said Pantagruel, my lord of Suckfizzle, say what you wish, and be brief without, however, omitting anything that will serve your purpose. Then my lord Suckfizzle pleaded his case. Then Pantagruel arose, assembled all the president, councillors, and doctors there present, and said to them, Well now, gentlemen, you have heard of vivae voces oraculo, the question that is in dispute. How does it look to you? And they replied, I have heard it indeed, but devil a bit of the case have we understood. We pray you, therefore, unanimously, and beseech you in courtesy to be so kind as to give sentence as you see fit. And ex nunc pro ex tunc, we will accept it and ratify it with our full agreement. Very well, gentlemen, said Pantagruel. Since you wish it, I will do so. But I do not find the case as difficult as you do. Your paragraph Cato, the law Freighter, the law Gallus, the law Quinquipedum, the law Venum, the law C. Dominus, the law Mater, the law Mulia Bona, the law Sequis, and plenty of others are, in my opinion, much more difficult. After saying this, he walked once or twice up and down the hall, thinking very deeply, as could be imagined. He groaned like an ass that is girthed too tight considering that he must do right to each one without bias or favoritism. Then he returned to his seat and began to pronounce the judgment that follows. Having seen, heard, and thoroughly considered the differences between my lords of Kiss My Ass and of Suck Fizzle, the court declares that, in view of the quaking of the bat, declining bravely from the summer solstice to woo the trifles which have checkmated the poem through the wicked vexations of the light shunners that are in the meridian of Rome, of an ape on horseback bending a crossbow backwards, the plaintiff had due cause to cork the vessel which the old woman was blowing up, with one foot shod and the other naked, reimbursing him low and stiff in his conscience, with as many bladder nuts as there is hair on eighteen cows, and as many for the embroiderer. But inasmuch as he charges the defendant that he was a butcher, a cheese eater, and a corker of mummy flesh, which has been found untrue in the sifting, as the said defendant has well argued, the court condemns him to pay three glassfuls of curds, cemented, pre tented and cod-pieced, according to the custom of the country, to the said defendant, payable at mid-August in May. But the said defendant shall be bound to furnish hay and stubble for stopping the prickles of his throat. 
confused with gobbets of meat well examined in slices, and let them be friends once more without costs and with good reason. After this sentence had been pronounced, the two parties departed, each satisfied with the decision, which was an almost incredible thing, for it had not happened since the great rains. Nor will it happen again for thirteen jubilees that two parties contending in judgment on opposite sides should be equally content with a definitive decision. As for the councillors and other doctors who were there present, they remained in a swoon of ecstasy for quite three hours, all entranced with admiration for Pantagruel's superhuman wisdom, which they clearly perceived in the decision of this most difficult and thorny case. And they would have remained in that state till now, had not a quantity of vinegar and rose water been brought to restore them to their ordinary sense and understanding, for which God be praised in all his ways. <laughs>